Okay, let's get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the tutorial on big data summarization. Uh, my name is Ehsan El Hamifar, and together with my colleagues, Amit Roy Chaudhry and Amin Karwasi, we are going to talk about methods for summarization of big data and their applications in computer vision. And much of the subject of this tutorial is really motivated by the vast amounts of data that today we are um, capturing uh, on the internet or through our social media websites such as Flickr, Instagram, and Facebook, and YouTube, or we are capturing through our sensory devices such as cameras, surveillance cameras, and CCTV cameras, and uh, cameras mounted on robots. Uh, every minute on YouTube, we are uploading around 400 hours of video, or um, on Facebook, we are uploading around 300 million photos every single day. And uh, this vast amount of data, in fact, has given us great opportunities for data mining by capturing underlying modes and patterns that are not seen in very small data sets. And as a result, they have led to improvement in the performance of learning and recognition and inference and decision-making systems. And in terms of recognition, this has affected very simple techniques such as, say, nearest neighbor-based methods. And one of the interesting examples in this uh, area is basically the work by Alyosha Afros and James Hayes, where they looked at the task of image completion, which is uh, you have an image, you have this unwanted part of the image that you want to remove, and then uh, you want to fill, fill that out in a way that the result is aesthetically pleasing for the user. And the idea is basically to go through a database of large images, try to find a few of the best matches, and they use the contents of those matches to fill out the image. And the interesting statements there are that, um, you know, we saw dramatic improvement when we moved from 10,000 10, samples or photos to 2 million images. And this has been a trend in other works, say, in retrieval of images and other examples exist, for instance, in the work of Toralba and Freeman, that the quality of retrieval significantly improves as the size of the data set increases. And on the other side of the spectrum, then we are dealing with deep neural networks, then the big data actually has been one of the main reasons for the success of the so-called deep neural networks. Uh, consisting of millions of parameters, these are systems that are data hungry and the large and vast amount of data has helped us to effectively train the so-called deep neural networks in order to achieve significant performance and boost in terms of performance in a variety of tasks such as recognition and detection. So these are some of the opportunities that this large and vast amount of data has provided. On the other hand, there are basically challenges attached to this vast amount of data. And one of the significant challenges is the limitation on the computational time and memory of devices and systems that need to deal with this vast amount of data. There is a part of research community uh, devoted to development of distributed and parallel processing and storage systems to effectively handle these large amounts of data. But all the evidence suggests that we are actually generating much more data than the capacities of our current systems. And this gap is actually going up exponentially with time. So that brings us to the main subject of this tutorial, which is how we can go from these very large data sets to small representative subsets of the data that capture the statistical properties of the original data set. And that's basically the task of subset selection, or also referred to as summarization. And clearly, one of the advantages is well, we can 
reduce significantly com the computational time and memory, but since we have captured the statistical properties of the original data and we have hopefully captured the modes and underlying patterns in the big data through a smaller set, we can retain the performance of learning, inference, and decision-making systems on the smaller data set. Or other applications of this would be, for instance, camera placement where you have a large set of possibilities or locations that you want to mount or install different cameras to monitor an, an environment and the goal would be to select very few of these locations that gives you the best, in a sense, coverage of the area. Another important application in computer vision is the task of video summarization. We are dealing with vast and massive amounts of and streams of video data, whether they are the videos that we are uploading on YouTube or the ones that we are capturing through our uh, surveillance videos or the ones that are uh, coming from uh, robots. And the goal would be take these video streams that are 24-7 and try to basically extract these sort of highlights of the important events and actions that are happening in a video uh, to do basically inference and learning later, train recognition systems using them or detection systems using them, or use them as means for better browsing and indexing and ranking of the data, of video data. And this is something that Amit is gonna talk more about it in his um, uh, talk this afternoon. Another important application of summarization is the task of procedure learning from instructional video data. Um, it's easy to get a large number of videos for the so-called how to do tasks. If I want to learn how to assemble a device or how to perform a certain task, say how to perform CPR, I'm just gonna go on the internet, search for it, or I'm gonna search YouTube for how to do CPR, and I'm gonna get a bunch of video data. And the goal of procedure learning is to look at all these video data with all their variations, and what is really the key is that across, despite all these variations across all the videos, all of them consist of a sequence of, a common sequence of key steps that needs to be performed in order to achieve the task. For instance, in the case of CPR, you need to perform, give compression, check breathing, give breath, and so on, and repeat this process. And this is really a form of summarization of data that today I'm gonna also talk about more about um, application of this um, using summarization. Learning abstract models from observations is another important application of subset selection or summarization where given sequences of observation and a large ensemble of models, the goal would be to select a subset of informative and representative models that can best represent or encode your, our observations. This could be used in order to fit, say, nonlinear models to time series data or perform segmentation of um, time series trajectories. Multiple pose estimation from images and image segmentation or other applications of image summarization in the area of computer vision. But outside the world of vision, there are many applications for subset selection and summarization itself, and that includes text and video summarization, social network and viral marketing, product recommendation, and so on. Okay. So now what, what I'm gonna do is talk about more detail about the components of a summarization scheme. So we are given this large data set and the goal is to reduce it to this small representative subset. So the first task that we need to address is how we can characterize the notion of informativeness of items in a data set. So what constitutes the notion of informativeness or representativeness of an item? And once we characterize this informativeness of items, then the next task would be then how we can recover these so-called most informative items. So to do that, one way to approach the problem is to look at the subset selection problem from an optimization perspective. 
we can look at this box of subset selection as an optimization on a so-called objective function or a utility function. And this objective function f that operates on subsets of data characterizes how well or how representative uh, the set or subsets of the data are. And once this has been characterized, then recovering the most representative items is really solving this optimization by searching over all possible subsets of the original data set. And the question would be how we can optimize these cost functions or utility functions effectively. So when it comes to choosing the criteria or objective functions, there have, the community has done a lot of work in terms of development of different criteria for subset selection. And that includes, includes DPPs, or called maximum volume parallelotope, multilinear sparse coding, graph cuts, maximum marginal relevance, facility location, and many other techniques. I'm going to talk about a few of them in this talk. So let's start with the determinantal point processes, or DPPs. So assume I give you a data set that consists of this set of vectors, y1, y2, up to say y capital N. And this is my data set. And I want to select a subset of most representative vectors from this data. So to set the notation, what we are going to do is to collect all these data points as columns of this matrix Y. And the goal would be to select the most representative columns of this data matrix. And this subset is called lambda. So the criteria for DPP is as follows. Let's find a subset of vectors so that when we take the parallelotope spanned by the set of vectors, the corresponding volume is maximized. So we are maximizing the volume of the parallelotope spanned by this set of vectors lambda. And we are searching over all possible subsets of the data set. So let's get a little bit of more intuition. So for instance, let's consider this two-dimensional data set. So assume that all these vectors are in two dimensions. And I start by taking just these two vectors, y2 and y3, and I'm looking at the volume of the corresponding parallel tope. In this case, it's going to be just the area of this parallel epithet, right? And it turns out the maximum volume is actually is going to be given by these two vectors, y2 and yn, because they are going to be the vectors that are going to expand them or give the highest area or the largest area. And it turns out once I add a new vector, the volume is going to shrink to zero. And the way to see it is that we can always characterize this volume by a determinant of a matrix Y lambda transpose Y lambda, where lambda are the sub, is basically a subset of the columns of uh, Y matrix. So once we have in two dimensions three vectors that are linearly dependent, then this matrix product is going to be singular, and the determinant, we know that based on linear algebra, is going to be zero. So the volume goes to zero. So the best set of vectors that DPP is going to select are those vectors that, roughly speaking, have large magnitudes, and they are sufficiently apart with respect to each other. So. DPP tries to select points that are linearly independent and sufficiently diverse. And that's why DPP has been used as a notion of or a criteria that promotes diversity of items. And a challenge in the case of DPP is that it could be prone to outliers so because it prefers points that are sufficiently apart and have a large magnitude. It might be the case that instead of selecting something from the inliers, I'm going to go and select points that are very far apart from the inliers but they have a large magnitude and sufficiently apart. The second criteria is basically motivated by the principal component analysis. And the idea of PCA, as we all know, is basically we are given a data set. We are going to represent it as a low dimensional basis times a vector or times a ve uh, matrix of coefficients x assuming that this basis is orthonormal. So it's, it's going to fit the data with basically a set of vectors that are orthonormal. And these vectors are going to 
capture the largest variance, the second largest variance of the data, and so on and so forth. Right? And it turns out that these principal directions are not necessarily coinciding by the actual data points, right? So these are arbitrary vectors in the ambient space. And the goal of subset selection is to select representative points. So how we can fix it, and we can extend PCA to do subset selection is by changing the problem as follows. Let's take the dictionary U to be the data matrix itself. So we are going to write Y as a combination of the data matrix Y. But this is a very silly problem in the beginning because you can write every point as a linear combination of itself. The idea of subset selection is that you want to actually select very few columns to reconstruct the entire data set. So if I want to select very few columns of this dictionary in order to reconstruct my data, it is equivalent to saying that I want to select very few non-zero rows of this coefficient matrix. And if I manage to do that, then I have been able to write the entire data set as a combination of very few representatives. So that means that we can modify the objective function of PCA by writing data as a combination of the data. So we have replaced the dictionary by the data itself. And we are looking at basically counting the number of non-zero rows of this coefficient matrix as a measure of the number of representatives. And it turns out for the cases where data lie in a union of subspaces, this optimization is going to select D plus one from each subspace where D is the dimension of, it, of that subspace. So in this case, for instance, with these two lines, I'm gonna select two points from this line, two points from that line. So in a sense, for independent subspaces, we are always guaranteed to sample from subspaces of the order of the dimension of them. So this seems to be a very good criteria for subset selection when data lie in low dimensionals, in a low dimensional subspace or a union of subspaces. But the question is, what about more general cases where data comes from some nonlinear manifold? So the third objective function that allows us flexibility and gives us flexibility to handle this general nonlinearity is the so-called facility location objective function. And the goal of facility location is that now I, instead of this feature representation of the data, I'm gonna give you pairwise similarities or dissimilarities between pairs of points. And the higher this, this, this similarity Sij is, it, that means that I is more similar to J, right? In the case of facility location, given these similarities, we want to find a subset of the data and assignment of every point to one and only one representative so that the total encoding cost is maximized. So let's look at this maximization a little bit closely. So for instance, assume that my set of representatives is this lambda, which consists of two elements, I1 and I2, right? So what I'm gonna do is take every point J in the data set and look whether I1 is a better representative for it or I2 is a better representative based on the similarities. And I'm gonna assign it to the closest representative. In this case, it's closer to I1, so I'm gonna give it the color of I1. And I'm gonna repeat it, and I'm gonna basically get this sort of clustering or partitioning of the data where all these blue points are assigned to I1, all the red points are assigned to I2, and then I'm gonna count or measure the total similarity of all the blue points to I1 plus all the similarity of all the red points to I2, and that's gonna be my cost function in this case. So that is going to give me this inner maximization and the sum over the inner maximization. And now the idea is we want to search exhaustively or over all possible subsets lambda in order to select the most representative items, right? Then I'm gonna select these two points as representative and then this is gonna give me another clustering or partitioning of the data. And then it turns out that this is gonna give me, for instance, a better encoding than the previous case. So this, for instance, is gonna be my optimal solution. So we are gonna repeat this across different choices of lambda. So this is really a clustering-based subset selection, which, unlike the previous cases, the criteria is really a clustering-based criteria. We are going to assign every point to representative and then we are maximizing the total encoding cost. 
And in the literature, because of this, often the representative are also called metoids of the data set. Now, having looked at a couple of these criteria for subset selection, the other part is how we can optimize these criteria. It turns out that almost all these criteria that exist, as long as they are reasonably well formulated, they're gonna lead to NP-hard and non-convex optimizations. So the complexity of the problem goes exponentially as you increase the size of the set and the size of the subset that you want to select. And that has motivated a lot of work in the literature in terms of development of efficient techniques for maximizing these different criteria. And that includes sampling from DPPs, branch unbound methods, convex relaxation, and submodular optimization. For instance, for the DPP that I talked about a few slides earlier, it's proven that finding this maximum volume parallelotope or even an approximation of that is going to be NP-hard. And there have been a lot of work in order to effectively and approximately maximize the objective function of DPP. And one approach is based on sampling from this distribution, which is what we are gonna do is to define a probability measure on the set of all subsets of the data where the probability of selecting lambda is going to be proportional to that volume that we define. And the volume, as I said, is going to be determinant of Y transpose Y lambda, right? And the goal would be to maximize or find the mode of this probability distribution. But this is exactly equivalent to the original problem and finding the mode of this distribution is MP hard part. So effectively addressing it, people have done sampling from the determinantal point processes. Instead of finding the mode, just draw samples from this DPP in order to get the maximum. And it turns out that we can maximize or we can sample from DPP efficiently and in polynomial time. And that involves taking eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition of this matrix of kernel Y transpose Y. On the other hand, several and actually many of the criteria for subset selection turn out to be in the class of submodular functions. Whether we take the logarithm of DPPs, graph cuts, maximum marginal relevance, and facility location, they all fall into the category of submodular functions. So what are submodular functions? A function or a set function, which is a function whose domain is set of all subsets of a ground set and whose domain is basically the R, is, sub is submodular if it satisfies the so-called diminishing return property. And the dimin diminishing return property is as follows that if I take a subset of data, lambda, and if I take a superset of, superset of that, gamma, and I take, take a look at, and I take basically one point outside the superset, i, the added value of i to gamma is going to be a smaller than the added value of i to lambda. So the increment of adding i to lambda is going to be bigger than when we add i to the bigger set. So the value of adding i to a set increases as the size of the set, decreases as the size of the set increases. So intuitively, let's consider an example where you are gonna be interviewing for a job at a startup company that has five employees. So the added value of you as an employee to that company is going to be much higher than if you take that company, say, 10 years later, when hopefully it has grown to tens of thousands of employees, and now you are going to be a new employee in that company, right? So the added value decreases as the size of the set increases. So again, maximizing a submodular function, f, with a cardinality constraint, is going to be NP-hard. And to effectively solve it, there has been a very efficient an actually simple algorithm called the Greedy algorithm or Nemhauser algorithm, named after the person who basically first came up with it, which basically starts with one element in an active set in order to do subset selection and grows this set one item at a time. 
So we start by selecting a point i that maximizes our utility function, and for k steps, if we want to select k representatives, we are going to select a, a point i so that once we add it to the current set, it maximizes the objective function. So we are going to grow the set incrementally, one at a time. And despite its simplicity, it has a very nice property that this is going to have an approximation guarantee is that if I denote the solution of this greedy algorithm by lambda hat and the solution of the true optimization as lambda star, the obtained value of this lambda hat through f is going, to, of course, to be less than the global optimal minimum, but it's not going to be very much away from the global optimal. It's going to be away by a factor of 1 minus 1 over e. So it's going to be away by 0 0.63 uh, factor from the global optima. And this is what Amin is going to talk about more in his talk after me, and he's going to talk about actually extension of this greedy algorithm to the case of streaming data and basically handling very large streams of uh, data using um, uh, a variety of greedy extensions. And last uh, is basically the class of convex and LP relaxations. It turns out that several of the criteria such as multilinear sparse coding and facility location allow efficient uh, convex relaxation. And to do this, uh, let's look at the multilinear sparse coding that I talked about. And the non-convexity actually comes from this counting the number of non-zero rows. I is an indicator function which is going to be non-zero or basically one when the argument is anything other than zero, and it's going to shrink to zero when the argument is zero. So this is non-convex, and the easy way to see it is that if I connect these two points, the function should, for it to be convex, should lie below the connecting line, but in this case, it's above the line. So how to relax it or take the closest convex function is basically, it turns out that the closest func convex function to this i is going to be simply the absolute value function or absolute value of z. So that means if I want to take a convex relaxation instead of the indicator of the LP norm, I'm going to simply take the absolute value of the LP norm, which is simply the LP norm. So instead, the convex relaxation would look like this. And it turns out that under certain conditions, this convex relaxation is going to give this exactly the same solution as the one coming from the non-convex formulation. And I'm going to talk about this part also more in the second session. All right, so um, I'm pretty done with giving an overview of summarization techniques. Um, after me, we are going to hear from Amin talking about the role of submodularity for summarization of large streams of data. Then we are going to have a break. Um, we are going to come back at 4, and we are going to, I'm going to talk about uh, s summarization of sequential data and in particular application of these techniques to the task of procedure learning from instructional data. And then we are going to hear from Amit about several interesting applications of um, summarization for the task of um, video summarization and in particular for summarization of camera network data and using the so-called incidental signals for better, uh, achieving better summaries. Um, so I'm going to ask Amin to come here and then sort of his presentation, but if there is any question at this point, I'll be happy to answer. Can you give me the clicker? Um, okay, I'm Amin Kiarbasi from Yale, and uh, thank you for coming to this session about uh, big data summarization. Um, so, Hassan talked about basically, you know, data summarization, what it is exactly, why do we need data summarization, and what I'm going to do is to talk about how we can do data summarization through the lens of submodularity, and then uh, um, how we can actually look at it through the lens of submodularity and what are the efficient algorithms to do it. So most of 
my presentation is, is going to be about algorithms. It's going to be about you know, how efficient they are, what is the time complexity, what is the approximation guarantee of such algorithms in very different scenarios. So as Essen said, <clears throat> the main challenge in data summarization is to come up with a method that can extract a small but a representative subset out of a massive data set. Okay? And uh, once we do that, basically, you know, we can remove redundancy from the data. And once we remove redundancy, we can run a lot of efficient algorithms that we used to be able to run, but now because the data is so B, we can no longer run them, okay? And it has been the case, and it has been shown empirically that, uh, you know, sometimes actually the algorithms work better and provide better uh, solutions if we run them on a representative subset rather than the whole data. So uh, a good summary basically has to have two criteria. The one is that it should be diverse, right? Because uh, it should not just only be from part of the data. We want to uh, you know, take uh, uh, different data points from different parts of the data. And at the same time, we want to be able to cover all, uh, you know, all parts of the data, right? And these two criteria seems to be a little bit in opposing directions. And uh, that is where exactly the diminishing returns property kicks in. And we're going to see how, basically, by looking at diminishing returns property and submodularity, at the same time, we can have diversity and coverage. Okay, so... Um, any good concept in computer science, or most of the good concepts in computer science, can be explained in terms of balls and beans. So submodularity is no uh, exception. So let me try to uh, motivate submodularity in that sense. So what we have here is uh, we have two urns. And uh, what uh, we care about, and the, basically the utility of each bean, is going to be the number of distinct colors. Okay. It's not the number of elements in each bean, it's the number of distinct colors. Uh, so uh, in the beginning, you know, the one on, uh, on the left has, uh, you know, the value is two, the one on the right has three, but then we add the same element to both of them, right? The value on the left goes up by one, uh, and on the right it doesn't change because, you know, it already had one red element in it, right? So if diversity, if representativeness is, you know, measured in terms of distinct colors, you see that, you know, it improved the, uh, the value on the left, but it didn't improve the value on the right. And that is exactly the, uh, the diminishing returns property. So to be more formal, uh, diminishing returns property is a property of a set function. So as Esan said, so we have a collection of data points. And then we have a function f that assigns a value to each subset of the data points. That is called a set function. A set function is going to be so modular it ha if it has the following property. That if if, uh, if um, I have two sets a and b here, so I have a here, and then I have b, where a is a subset of b. And then I add the same element and ask myself, what is the marginal gain of adding the same element to both sets A and B? If the marginal gain of adding uh, a similar element, here a plane, to the set A is going to be more than adding it to its superset, then the function is going to be submodular. Okay? So basically, adding an element to a smaller context is going to help more than adding it to a larger context. So that is some modularity, but it has nothing to do with monotonicity, okay? So we say that a function f is going to be monotone if adding elements is not going to hurt, if adding elements is only going to increase the utility. We can have some modular functions that are monotone, and we can have some modular functions that are not monotone. So, um, Throughout uh, the presentation, I'm going to basically run, you know, the algorithms I'm presenting on two running examples. One is the image summarization that Esan talked about, 
And basically, we have a huge collection of images. We want to you know, summarize it uh, and give just a few examples. And uh, you know, a very simple objective function that people use is uh, you know, try, a loss function that people try to minimize is basically the uh, k medoids objective function. Right? So we want to minimize this thing here, which means that we want to find some representative values such that the sum of the, uh, the similarity of images with their associate uh, representatives is uh, minimum. So that's a minimization problem, but one can easily turn this minimization problem into a maximization problem by simply adding a dummy element and then look at the reduction in the loss. Okay? So this function here happens to be a submodular function. Minimization of this function is equivalent to maximization of this function. And that is the way that people actually try to do exemplar-based clustering. I have to note here that um, you know, the difference between exemplar-based clustering and the usual clustering is that in clustering, we can have cluster centers that are in the middle, somewhere here, for instance, right? Here or here. In exemplar-based clustering, it doesn't make any sense to return an example uh, uh, an exemplar that is not a data point. I cannot return three images that are a combination of other images. That doesn't make any sense. Okay? That's the reason that we have this extra condition that the, um, that the uh, centers should be one of the data points. Okay? And uh, in fact, that is exactly a facility location objective function that Anson talked about. The other example that I'm going to talk about is non-parametric learning in massive data. These problems are notoriously hard uh, because basically the complexity of the model depends on the size of the data. It, and they're very hard actually to scale. So um, concretely we have, like in, in, you know, in the case of regression, we have a function f that depends on the whole data set and it can be represented as a combination of kernel coefficients in a, in a very high dimensional uh, setting, okay? So it is basically this huge sum. So in order to actually do that, first of all, you have to basically populate the kernel. If you have n data points, that is going to amount to n squared operations. And then you have to find these coefficients, which means that usually you have to invert the matrix, that is going to be n cube. So if you have million data points, good luck. You, you won't be able to do that. So what people do often in practice is that they try to come up with a subset, say a representative subset, such that this function here approximate this full function here. Okay, we just want to find a few entries such that this thing here will be very close to this. So in particular for the Gaussian processes, the way that it has been done, or at least one of the very popular ways, is the informative vector machine. And it means that, um, so the way that people try to find this, in, uh, this element is by maximizing the mutual information between the points that they have picked and the process. And if you go through the math, the mutual information is going to be exactly this log determinant function. So the determinant here is the same as in DPP. And the log determinant function, you can show that it is again a submodular function. So for any subset A, this log determinant basically, you know, you have to find the principal metrics that consists of the indices uh, of A, and then you have to find the log of that I plus that matrix, and this function is going to be a submodular function. So among all subsets, what we would like to do is to find the one that maximizes this. And of course, there are many, many, many other examples that coming from different communities um, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, in order to summarize the data, you know, clustering 
was one of the examples, but there are many other ways of clustering that happen also to be submodular. In recommendation systems, again, you know, the utility function that people usually use in order to model the uh, user's behaviors are submodular, and it has uh, you know, something to do with the economics of scale. Document summarization, but we would like to basically find, let's say, you, know, you want to summarize a book with few sentences. Uh, very often, the uh, objective function that people use are submodular. And what is very interesting is that uh, you know, researchers came up with very intuitive objective function without knowing that they are submodular. It was you know, years later that um, you know, people from machine learning community showed that, well, you know, these functions are submodular. That is why it works very well. Corpus selection or subset selection that is on talked very often are submodular. And then basically what you know, this whole list means is that we have a utility function f that is often monotone submodular, but not necessarily. And we are going to talk about the cases that the function is not monotone. And we, what we would like to do is to maximize this f of a, and usually we have constraints. Okay, so if I want to find a small representative subset, for instance, that means that I would like to find at most k elements. But there are other constraints that we can think of which are more, much more complicated and can model other things. For instance, you might be interested in summarizing the data in such a way that from each category, there is only a handful of data points. That is not going to be modeled by this simple size or cardinality constraint. Okay, so that is a problem. And today I'm going to talk about different methods in order to solve this problem. Basically, a centralized solution, streaming solution and distributed solution, okay? So in a centralized solution, what does it mean? I have data and I have a computer, but I can load the data on my own computer. It's not that big. And then how can we solve the problem? So there is, a, as Essan said, there is a very simple greedy algorithm that does the job. Basically, let's say that I want to find a subset of uh, size three from this small uh, set of elements. So what the greedy algorithm does is that it goes three times over the data set. And then at each iteration, it finds element that maximizes the marginal gain. It finds the best element in the data, okay? And after three iterations, basically it is done and it is going to return a set of size three in general, I say, you know, if the cardinality constraint is k, it's going to return a set of size k. So what is the approximation guarantee of this algorithm? So that is going to, um, so the value that the algorithm is going to return is going to be 1 minus 1 over the approximation of the best solution that you can possibly find. So there are a couple of questions here. First of all, is it possible to find the best solution? That is an NP-hard problem. So, you know, you have basically, it is more than NP-hard. So it has been shown that information theoretically it is impossible to actually, without making uh, exponentially many queries, find uh, the best solution. The next question is that, is this the best approximation guarantee you can get? Any idea? Can you actually think of a better algorithm? What is funny is that it turns out it is MP hard to get a better approximation than this. So I always ask this question because if you know a better algorithm, then you already solve an MP hard problem. So you never know. That might happen. Okay. So that's the best we can hope for. And this very simple algorithm does the job. Okay, but what was the, uh, you know, uh, what is the drawback of the algorithm? Well, I wanted to find a set of size k, so the number of operations that I had to do was n times k, right? I had to go k times over the data, and at each iteration I had to make basically n function evaluations. So if k is on the order of n, then that is going to be a quadratic algorithm. 
So that's not good, right? So we are you know, in the business of having very fast algorithms, so quadratic algorithms are not going to cut it. The question is, can we actually get an algorithm that runs faster? Can we, for instance, have an algorithm that is linear? The first idea is basically you know, subsampling. So how can we actually get a linear time algorithm? Well, what we can do is that the greedy algorithm, what it did was going over the, you know, at each iteration was going over the whole data. Instead, what we can do is to subsample n over k points at each iteration and only evaluate those. Okay? So, like, uh, so that is going to be one iteration. We find the best one among the ones that we uh, evaluated. Then in the second iteration, we are going to you know, evaluate a few others. In the third iteration, we are going to do basically the same thing. So it's, again, very simple by subsampling. Is it going to work? So first of all, you know, how many operations did we do? There were k iterations. And at each iteration, we picked a subset of n over k. So in total, it was n. So it is very linear. What is interesting is that we could recently show that this algorithm, in expectation, gives a constant factor approximation. It's not 1 minus 1 over e. It is 1 minus 1 over e squared. So it is worse. Now you might say that, you know, I really want 1 minus 1 over e. Uh, you know, my life depends on 1 minus 1 over e. I cannot get anything worse. Can we do that? Well, you can do it by just increasing a little bit this uh, subsampling probability. So right now, the probability that we subsample is 1 over k, right? We look at each element with 1 over k, we you know, evaluate it, otherwise we don't. Now let's increase a little bit this probability. So I'm going to increase it with log 1 over epsilon. So whenever you see log, it's basically nothing. So now, it's practically the same algorithm. And I don't know why uh, you know, we are running again this thing. So um, again, what we can show is that by just increasing a little bit, right, the heating probability. In expectation, you can get 1 minus 1 over e minus epsilon approximation. Again, that is tight. So, and if you wonder why, you know, you should have log 1 over epsilon, again, it has something to do with balls and bins operation. So what we, we are trying to do is that we are trying to hit the good elements with high probability. And over, you know, probability 1 over k is not going to cut it, but probability 1 over k times log 1 over epsilon is going to do it. So this is an expectation, but recently people showed that it is not only an expectation that you know, this is correct with high probability too. So it's a stronger result. OK, so that is basically the first linear time algorithm that uh, gets 1 minus 1 over approximation guarantee. Now, let's look at uh, you know, our two examples. One was uh, you know, non-parametric learning, and the other one was exemplar-based clustering, and see how it works with respect to the greedy algorithm. That is a greedy in terms of the running time. These are the stochastic variants that I just showed with different values of epsilon. So epsilon here is 0 0.9, right? Epsilon can be only between 0 and 1. I put here 0 0.9. But still, you see that you know, as you increase the summary size, greedy just goes up, but the other ones are like nothing with respect to greedy. And let's look at the utility. Well, here is the utility of the greedy algorithm. These are the other ones. So these are, these are the two stochastic variants. And this is the rad. So it works pretty well. Much faster, though. Now, you might say, well, you know, uh, okay, greedy is not the algorithm that people use in practice. There is something called lazy greedy that, you know, works much faster. 
it doesn't have any upper, you know, it doesn't have any guarantee in terms of uh, running times, but it works faster. So how about that? Uh, well, we tried that too, uh, and then you, again the same story, right? So uh, the lazy greedy is basically the one on the top here, and then in terms of you know, this is the utility. So basically, all the stochastic variants are very close, but then in terms of running time. Uh, you know, stochastic variants are much, much faster. They're linear, basically, right? They don't, the, the, you know, the time complexity doesn't increase, whereas for the other ones, it does. Okay, so it's going to be exactly the same story for the exemplar-based clustering, uh, you know, which I'm not going into the, de uh, into the details. Okay, so um, what we have talked so far was basically I have a utility function here, and I had a cardinality constraint here. I assume that the utility function is monotone. The constraint that I have here is a cardinality constraint. But very often, you want you know, much more complicated functions, functions that are not necessarily monotone. If you, as you increase, as you put more and more elements, the function might actually start going down. Or you know, instead of the cardinality constraint, you might have you know, metroid constraints, intersectional metroids, knapsack constraints, et cetera. Right? Elements might have you know, different values for you. Like you know, uh, adding one element it may actually cost you much more than any another element. So uh, let me just briefly go through you know, what you can do in the, uh, when the function is not monotone, right? Adding elements might actually hurt you. And the simplest case is basically the function is not monotone and you don't have any constraint. Any subset is fine. You just have to maximize the function. Okay? But the deal is that it's not monotone. How can you do that? Well, it's very easy actually to see that the greedy algorithm is not going to work anymore. So what is very interesting about the double greedy algorithm it's a particular way of running greedy algorithms twice and get approximation guarantees. It is very interesting the way it does. So what we do is that we start from two sets, A knob and B knob, where A knob doesn't have any elements. It's like this. B knob has all the elements. Okay? And then we look at the first element. We check, is it better to add the element to a zero or remove it from B zero? Whichever is better, whichever gives us more gain, we are going to do that. So let's say that it was better to add. So it's going to be added to a zero. So a one is going to have this element and B1 is not, going to, is not going to change. Now let's look at E2. So in that case, it was not a good idea to add it. So we are going to remove it from B. E3, it was not a good idea we are going to remove. It was a good idea we are going to add. So if you look at this algorithm, what you can observe is that as we go on, so here, for instance, this, you know, the sixth iteration, you can easily argue that the first six items in A and B are exactly equal. Okay, either we remove from one or we add to the other. So when we finish, both sets have exactly the same item. A n and B n are going to be equal. And you, you just return one of them. So what uh, these guys could show, which was actually a breakthrough, was that it, this simple algorithm gives you one third approximation guarantee. Now you might say, is this the best thing you can do? It turned out it is not the best thing you can do. Again, you have to make use of randomization, as we did for the monotone case. So there were smart people and said, okay, so that was a deterministic algorithm. How can we turn it into a randomized algorithm? Well, this time they just said, before we were just looking at the marginal gains and deciding which way we have to go. Now they say, well, 
instead of looking at the marginal gains, let's interpret them as probabilities. Okay? So we look at E1 and then we just look at you know how much it adds, right? Xi is you know how much adding E1 to A0 is going to be, Y1 is going to be how much removing from B B0 is going to be. And then proportional to those values, we are going to either add or remove. So it's going to be a randomized algorithm this time. So it doesn't run exactly as before because you know with some probability we are going to add, with some probability we are going to remove, but they are proportional to the marginal gains. Again, at the end, we are going to have exactly, you know, AN and BN are going to have the same kind of elements. But then what is sick is that this algorithm gives one half approximation guarantee and that is tight. It is MP hard to get anything better. And that was actually an open problem for many years in the uh, combinatorial optimization community. You know, to come up with uh, one half approximation guarantee, people actually didn't know whether it is possible or not. And these guys with this very simple algorithm could actually achieve it. Well, the analysis is, you know, truly complicated, but the algorithm is very simple. This is an impressive result. Okay, so let's say the function is non-monotone. What can I do if I have constraints? Okay, so before we were looking at the exactly same problem, but f was monotone, so adding elements was helpful. Now this time we're going to be looking at the case where you know, it is non-monotone. So greedy, the way that it worked, was always going to you know, pick the best element, right? Now this random greedy algorithm, what it does is that it first looks at the top k elements, here are three, and randomly samples one of those. So it is basically a robust version of the greedy algorithm. Okay, so the top k element, pick one at random. Put it in your solution. Run again, pick to the top k elements instead of top one, right? The top k, randomly sample. Put it in your set. And then what you can show, again, these are the same you know, set of others. They could show that this algorithm, when the function is non-monotone, gives you one over E approximation guarantee. What is even nice or nicer about this algorithm is that if the function is monotone, the algorithm, the same algorithm, gives you one minus one over E approximation guarantee. So somehow the algorithm is completely oblivious to the fact that the function is monitored or not. It just works. And then if you have, you know, a more constraints, like, you know, the most general, probably one of the most general things is that if you have a pay extendable system that you can model time, all sorts of, you know, categories, etc., then we can extend the idea. So we have a general submodular function we have a P extendable system. The way that it works is that with this probability, we are going to subsample the data set and then run greedy on that. As simple as this. And then it turned out that we can actually show, you know, this randomized algorithm uh, gives a constant factor approximation that depends on P. So if you run greedy, it's not going to work. Greedy is going to, you know, work, it's going to perform arbitrarily poorly. But what is interesting is that if you subsample, then run greedy, it is going to work. So somehow this subsampling helps the greedy algorithm not to get stuck in expectation. And then we could also show that, you know, there is no actually approximation guarantee better than P plus one half. So it is pretty tight. Okay, now you can extend, you know, we could extend it to also, you know, L knapsacks, etc. It's not really important. So the, you know, the bottom line is that 
Nowadays, we have very, very fast algorithms, centralized, very fast algorithms for general submodular functions under general constraints. Okay, so uh, that was, you know, the situation when we have, you know, the data was small. Now, in the streaming uh, uh, case, you know, either we have this situation that the data is very big and this is your computer. Pictorially, you cannot put this into this. Conceptually, you cannot do it. So, and that is, you know, all, all of your comp computing powers. Can you maximize the function? You have a utility function, you want to maximize it. Can you basically, by accessing only small parts of the data, just going, let's say, once over the data, but only each time accessing a small part of it, is it possible to maximize the fun, you know, the utility? That is one situation. Another situation that is very important, and Esan talked and touched upon it a little bit, is that you know the, the data might actually come in a very fast rate. So, and that is okay. Just a simple um, clip of that, if it runs. So basically. Uh, you know, it, it might be a video, and um, what you have to do is that, uh, okay, it's not running correctly, so sorry for that. Uh, it would have been funnier if you could see it. So basically, there is a clip, and then, you know, it, the movie frames come in, they arrive at a fast pace. On the fly, you have to pick the, you know, the representative ones, the ones that have some, uh, you know, important information. Okay, so you don't have, you know, you don't have the uh, capacity to store the data nor the time to go back and, you know, check whether that was good or not. On the fly, when the element comes, you have to decide. So, you know, all the centralized algorithms that we talked about, they have to go multiple times over the data. So they, they, they won't be able actually to do any, uh, any summarization in the streaming setting. So can we do it? The first idea that people uh, 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 proposed was the streaming greedy algorithm, which was basically, um, it's, the greed, it's a greedy solution. So what does it do? Let's say that this is the data stream, the new data comes, and then you check. Is it better to swap the data, this data point with this one, or with this one, or with this one? Does it make sense, right? If swapping is going to increase the utility, if it does, you just do it. If it doesn't, you don't. All right, that's very simple. But it turns out it's a very bad idea. And let's see why it is not good. And let's look at a very simple example of a submodular function. It's uh, the coverage function, the weighted coverage function. So what I'm trying to do now is that elements have weights, and I want to pick a subset of elements of size k such that the weights, the sum of weights is maximized, okay? So this is, you know, one of the elements and the weight of that element is one. So I pick it, so that's the first element, that's the second element, that's the chaos element. All have value one, okay? Now a very good element comes. Swapping that element with any of them is not going to change the union, right? I still have only one through k. This element has the weight k, whereas all these elements have weight one. But still, I'm not going to swap because it's not going to increase my utility. So that's gone. Now k plus one has one plus epsilon. I'm going to swap. k plus two, I'm going to swap. Two k, I'm going to swap. Again, a very good element comes. I'm not going to swap. That's how the algorithm works. So, so as you can see, all the good elements are not going to be swapped. All the bad ones are swapped. So basically, uh, that is you know, the set that this simple algorithm returns. The best that you could have done, oh, so that, that is, okay. The, this is the set that the algorithm picks. The best you could have done was basically picking these elements, the big ones. And you can see that you know, the approximation guarantee goes down with you know, 1 over k. So what went wrong here was that we were too greedy. Or we had very low standards. As long as it was a little bit better, we just swapped. 
So how could, we, how could we fix the problem? Where we just put a threshold. We just say that we are not going to go lower than this. If the, if the marginal gain is lower than this, I'm not going to pick the element, even though it's going to increase the utility. Okay, so that is basically what it says here. So if the marginal gain of swapping is less than this, so whatever I have divided by K, if it is less than that, I'm not going to do it. Otherwise, I'm going to do it. So, okay, in the first K elements we are going to pick, okay, so there is nothing else. I have the capacity to pick. I'm going to pick it. Then the new element comes, so it's full. Now what should I do? So I try to see whether I can swap or not and whether it is above the threshold. So that is my current set. And then I check with the first one, the second one, the third one, pick the best, right? And then uh, it was above the threshold. I'm going to do it. Now the next element comes. That is the, you know, the best swap I can do. It is still above the threshold. I'm going to do it. This element comes. Uh, it is above the threshold, I'm going to do it. This one comes, the best swap is this, and then, so what, so by just, you know, putting some standards on, you know, how we are going to swap elements, you can actually get a constant factor approximation, which is one fourth. Okay? Now again, always you have to ask, is this the best we can do? It turns out it is not. So uh, just slightly smarter way is actually the following thing to do. Um, so that is our data stream. And in order to explain, let me just assume that I have a genie okay, that gives me a value v that is between the opt and alpha times opt. Okay? So for now, I just assume that I have this genie. The genie doesn't give me the best set, it just gives me an approximate of the value of the best set. Now what can I do with that? Well, I can actually set a threshold, like before, a little bit different, more complicated, but the same idea. If the marginal gain is above that, you know, this is the V, this is V half minus F of S, you know, the current solution divided by K minus S. If it is above, I'm going to pick. If it is not, I'm not going to pick, okay? Every time that I pick an element, my margin, you know, the value is going to go at least by this. So what you can show is that, well, first of all, that was a one pass algorithm, right? I didn't have to go multiple times over the data. What you can show is that the value that this algorithm returns is going to be the alpha opt divided by half. The size of the memory is K, right? I didn't increase the size, I only picked K elements. And the update time was O of 1, meaning that I had only one threshold to convert. What is the problem with this algorithm? It is just right in front of you. Genie. The genie. I assume that I have the genie. Okay, so let's uh, try to have a uh, like a less a stronger genie, okay? Now, okay, uh, let's assume I have this little genie that instead of giving me opt, it gives me the, the best among all, you know, all elements, the best singleton, okay? The value of the, be, uh, uh, you know, the highest singleton. Submodularity implies that opt is going to be between M and K times M. Okay, now what can I do? Well, this is M, this is K times M. I know opt is somewhere here. I don't know where. Now, here is what we can do. We are going to have multiple guesses for opt. Okay, so this point is M times one plus epsilon. This point is M times one plus epsilon squared. So with uh, geometrically increasing the distances, and at some point I'm going to get to K times M. Okay, how many of these points am I going to have? Log k over epsilon. Okay. One of them is very close to the opt. I don't know which one, but certainly one of them is close. So, 
What I can do is that I run exactly the same algorithm with multiple guesses. Before I had one threshold, now I have log k over epsilon thresholds. So an element comes, I have these many thresholds, I just, you know, ex run the same thing with different thresholds. Another element comes, it just goes into two buckets, you know, this one goes only to one, this one goes to the other three, etc. Okay? So, still it's a one-pass algorithm. What you can show is that the solution that you get, basically, so what is the final solution? You just return the best among these sets, right? Each one of them has size at most k. How many do I have? Log k over epsilon. So my memory is going to be k log k over epsilon. So it, it's going, I have to increase it a little bit. The update time is going to be log k, one over, log k over epsilon because now I have log k over epsilon thresholds. So what is the problem with this? The little genie, right? I assume that I know what is m. Now let's solve that. So, what we can do is that on the fly, we can just adjust the value of m. Whenever a new element comes, you just check. Is it better than the best I had or not? And then instantiate this interval. This one, even though it's a very natural idea, is not going to work. The only change that we have to do is, the, is to increase the net, basically twice larger. And that too has everything to do with the one half approximation guarantee. But it is basically the same thing. So now a new element comes, current value of m is 0 0.6, I run the algorithm, and uh, you know, at some point another element comes that changes the value of m, so some of the buckets are no longer useful. I will have some new ones, but in total, the number of buckets is going to be on the order of log k over epsilon. So that's a fully one pass streaming algorithm that gives one half approximation guarantee. The memory is k log k over epsilon, and the update time is log k over epsilon. So just, uh, just to remind you, before we had an algorithm that had one fourth approximation guarantee, the memory was k. Now we had to increase a little bit the memory, but get uh, one, one half approximation guarantee. What is interesting is that you can again show uh, that getting better than one half approximation guarantee in the streaming setting is impossible. Okay, so if you want to go one pass over the data, the best you can hope for is one half approximation unit. Even though in the centralized setting, the best was one minus one array. Good, so, um, uh, so let's just look at some, you know, the stream greedy algorithm, which is actually a very, very famous baseline and it works very well in practice. And our algorithm, so everything is normalized in terms of utility and cost. And now, you know, the data set before it was like, uh, for the centralized setting, it was like 30,000, 40,000. You can, you know, push it to 100,000, but not more. Now, for a streaming setting, you can go to millions. Okay, and so that is a stream greedy. That is the random. Well, you know, random, you don't have to do much. You just randomly pick, but the utility sucks. And this is our setting. Basically, it works very fast, but, uh, you know, utility is very, very high. And uh, it's the same thing for the you know, non-parametric regression, and this time it is like 40 million data points. Okay. okay. It's the same story. Now again, uh, the question is, can you actually do it in more general settings, right? So I just talked about monotone, under cardinality constraint. The question is, can you do it in general? You, you have a general submodular function. It may not be monotone. You might have like intersection of metroids or you know, much more complicated things. Uh, again, you know, randomization is going to come to save us. So what means is that whenever a new element comes, with some probability, I'm not even going to look at it. I'm just going to drop the element. It depends on p, it doesn't matter, so it's a function of p. 
That's just math. And with other parallel, you know, and then if it happens to not be dropped, and then I check, is it good to swap or not? So basically, this is it. So the algorithm, you know, the first element comes, it was, you know, not one of the lucky ones, it got dropped immediately, the second one came, and then it went through the, you know, chain. the third one, not lucky, the fourth one, uh, so exchange algorithm accepted, and then this one came, now this one, it was not a very good exchange, okay? And that was a good swap, etc. Okay? So then again, what we could show was that this very simple thing works in general. And you can get constant factor approximation for general submodular functions under very general constraints. Good. So any questions up to this point before I go to the distributed setting? When, so, so the question is, you know, when a new element comes, is it possible actually to discard everything that you had before? So uh, that depends on the uh, utility of M. It might happen. Yeah, so the utility of this single element. Okay. Now let's look at the distributed setting. So what is, you know, what is a distributed setting? Basically the data is big, but then you suddenly have a lot of competing power. Basically you're Google. So can you uh, make use of it? Okay. Again, uh, you know, the, qu the main question is can we parallelize the greedy approach? The greedy approach that we had, it was, you know, sequential, right? So it, it's not amenable to uh, uh, parallelism. Now the simple idea that we came to was a very simple two-stage distributed algorithm that you can easily implement it in, you know, uh, MapReduce or you know Apache Spark. We actually implemented on uh, on MapReduce. So how how does the algorithm work? Well, this is your data. It's very big. What you do is that you just divide arbitrary your data in, onto different machines, and then on each machine, it is the data is small enough that you can run the greedy algorithm. So each machine runs the greedy algorithm. They send all their results to a central machine. That machine runs another round of greedy algorithm and returns a very small set. Now the question is, what is the utility of this very small set with respect to the utility of an, a centralized algorithm on the full data, right? If you could have run a centralized algorithm on this big data, what would be the difference between the two? Okay? So it turns out that, you know, if you arbitrarily partition the data, the approximation guarantee is not going to be very good. So it's going to basically scale down with the number of machines and the you know, number of data points that you want to pick, like the summary. But what is very nice is that if you randomly sample, so again, the idea of randomization is going to help, if you randomly split the data onto these machines, then uh, you'll get a constant factor approximation. So basically, um, it was shown independently by these two groups of people that you know, random, sub, you know, random partitioning of the data is going to give you one minus one over your half approximation to the, uh, uh, to the optimum solution, if you could run it on the full data. Okay, so uh, just uh, you know, our implementation on Hadoop with uh, you know, these many data points, so that is the greedy algorithm, the you know, greedy distributed algorithm. And these are all the other baselines. You know, you can do different things, you know, in the, these two stage 
right? You can just, you know, in one stage you can just randomly pick elements, in, you know, you can pick more elements in one stage, less elements in another stage, you know, all sorts of, you know, baselines. But it seems that, you know, this very simple greedy, greed eye algorithm, this distributed algorithm is going to work uh, the best in this setting. And we actually have implementations when the data is small, we compare, you know, the centralized and the distributed setting, and they're just, you know, indistinguishable, right? They work exactly the same. But, okay, instead of the graph, probably if I show, you know, uh, some uh, exemplars right, of, you know, the solutions that is returned by greed eye, it might be more convincing. So these are 64, uh, you know, um, uh, images that are returned by our, greed, you know, distributed greedy algorithm on 80 million uh, images. That's a um, tiny images data set. Okay? So these are the examples. Let's look at some of them. So let's look at this one. And let's see, you know, what are the other close by images that the algorithm didn't pick. And these are the ones. They all look very, very similar, but, but using this distributed algorithm, some modularity, we only pick, you know, a representative one. Let's look at this, you know, it's a sunrise on a sunset. These are the close by ones, okay? So in conclusion, you know, one way or another, either by submodularity or other methods, we have to uh, deal with big data. And we have to try to summarize the big data, get the representative elements, because like it or not, we are doing it. So, you know, the, the naive way that people do it is that once they don't have the capacity, they just randomly subsample the data. They just say, well, I'm going to read this much data. I don't have, you know, any more memory. I'm going to discard the rest. So that's a very, you know, that's a very naive way to do it. And, you know, you're going to lose in terms of utility. And we have seen, you know, all the random uh, subsampling of the data, they're going to do much worse than, you know, intelligent way of doing it. And submodularity gives us a way. It's a very unifying way of doing it, right? It's certainly not the only way, but, you know, algorithmically it's very easy and conceptually it makes sense to do it. And uh, so what I try to show is that, you know, the, all the progress that we and other people in, in the community try to do using submodularity in order to summarize the data and come up with you know, strong approximation guarantees. You know, what is possible, what is not possible, what's the best thing to do, what is not the best thing to do. And, you know, get a very clear picture of where we stand. So in this, uh, you know, tutorial, I try to, you know, convince you that we have very good, you know, centralized algorithms. There are some streaming algorithms that work very well uh, in practice and some distributed versions. And uh, so what we are, you know, Amit is going to talk and Asan is going to talk later is, you know, uh, other ways of summarizing the data. When the data comes in a streaming manner, you know, I was just, you know, showing a very silly example that, you know, we have these clips and we have to uh, pick the frames according to this particular utility function. But, you know, there are many more interesting functions that you can look at. And again, many of them can be actually uh, we can come up with surrogates of modular functions to, uh, to get approximation guarantees. Thank you very much. They don't have access to each other. What kinds of communication do they need? So, so that's a map reduce way, right? So what it means is that um, there is no communication between these guys. Okay. okay, so they run the greedy algorithm on their own data. And then that's the reason that you need the, this guy here that they send the data to. Okay, so, and then this guy is going to run another greedy. So the communication, so it is, in map reduced mode, there is no communication between you know the machines at each stage, but in the next stage you can have communication between this and the, the other guys. So in this case, uh, we didn't send back any elements to the original ones and run again, you know, another round of uh, map reduce. People do it, uh, and there are many good reasons to do it. Like you can actually have uh, some communication between the computing units. 
And there are also results about it. Like you can actually get better than this one minus one over E half approximation guarantee. If you allow more rounds of parallelism and some communication between the machines. Right, so this, so the lower monitor that you have, that mm -hmm. is completely removed, you just have communication between, so I'm, I'm thinking about like a consensus kind of an Uh-huh, oh, okay, so that's a different thing. So, okay, very good. So this is a master-slave kind of architecture. In consensus, basically, you have these uh, uh, competing units, and then you have a network that they, you know, they, they're connected to each other, and then they send information to each other. They try to get uh, uh, to some consensus, uh, hopefully, you know, maximizing the function. There was, there was no work about consensus algorithms. We have the first one in this ICML. So there is a, so we came up with a consensus algorithm for some marginal maximization, but it is much more involved than, so all these ideas that I talk about, they have, they are discrete, right? In discrete domain, we are trying to do things. I have, you know, there are discrete functions, all the operations are discrete. You cannot do it in discrete domain. So you have to hallucinate the continuous extensions of these functions, and then try to basically send the gradients Right, okay, so it's much more complicated. I'm not going to get into detail, but there are you know, very efficient ways of going from discrete submodular functions to continuous domain. Okay, so there are uh, these things called multilinear extensions. And uh, actually the tightest approximation guarantees that we know of submodular maximization are, th are through these continuous relaxations. Okay? So once you do that, you go to the continuous domain, then there are consensus algorithms in the continuous domain. You try to run those. The problem is that you run it, you run them, and then you get to a fractional solution, right? Because it's a continuous problem. You get to 0 0.2, 0 0.5. But you need an integral solution because that's a set. Then there is a problem about how to round the solution. So you have to take care of all these things, and you can, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a one hour talk by itself like how to do all these things, you know, all these modules together in order to have a consensus algorithm for functions that are not convex actually. So you take these multilinear extensions are not convex. So all, all the things that we know about consensus algorithms are out the door. Uh, so it becomes very tricky, but it is possible. So you have an ICM on that, yes. It is called decentralized submodular maximization. 